here because specifically we just finished up on an update to our Join the Effort booklet. So if you see on your table, don't take those home, they were expensive to me. But I just wanted everyone to get an idea of what the PDF looks like on our website. And this booklet um, is basically for any, any organization that is interested in learning how they can help the UHC and, and help the industry as a whole with facing um, or, and, and helping with the issues that are surrounding adverse courses. They can take a look at this booklet and it gives them some ideas both from very small scale, easy, free things that they can do all the way up to um, you know, creating a foundation. So there's some really great stuff in that booklet. Take a look. Um, share the link to the, the PDF on your sites if you get an opportunity to do so. The more people we have looking at this, the better. The more industry involvement we have, the better. So um, I'm going to introduce our, our panelists. So their bios are all in the AHC program. Um, so we have Sarah Coleman, who's with the Kentucky Horse Council. And she is going to be wearing two hats today. So she's, she's going to be talking about the uh, Save Our Horses Fund and also Vet Direct. We have Katie Kleinfeld, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. OK, thank <laughs> you. I probably should have checked before her. Um, and Alex Fox, who's with our partners at A Home for Every Horse. We have Dr. Kate Lewis and Dr. Carl Okay, great. Okay, good. Um, from Colorado Unwanted Horse Alliance. Thank you for coming today. Um, and Kristen Warner, who is our UHC chair from the Jockey Club, and she's been talking about the Thoroughbred Connect and other thoroughbred support programs. Thank you. Okay, so question one. This is going to be directed at everybody, and I think maybe we'll just do Fluffer if that works. Um, so tell us about the different programs that your organization offers that can potentially help to assist horse owners in need or any other resources that your organization offers um, that assist at-risk horses. And you have four minutes. Four minutes each. <laughs> we'll start with you, Carl. I, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So go ahead and tell us about the different programs, or, or Kate, you can, either one of you, whichever one wants to sort of head it off. Um, tell us about the different programs that your organization offers uh, that can potentially help to assist horse owners in need, or any other resources your organization offers that can assist at-risk horses in the general sense. I'll let Dr. She does all the work. <laughs> um, so Colorado Unwanted Horse Alliance um, is a statewide organization. That, um, we offer several different programs um, to different entities throughout the state. So um, basically we initially offer, we have an annual grant funding program for um, rescues shelters, 501c3s. Um, we also offer those annual grants to veterinarians, um, farriers, and law enforcement. Um, so they don't have to be a 501c3, but they have to be one of those other three things if That's they really are not. That's really good to know. So, I didn't know um, we did include those. Um, we also have what we call an at-risk grant, which is a year-round program that um, basically an emergency granting fund um, for rescues who get unexpected intakes um, of horses that need extra care or um, it can pay for hay for horses that were taken in unexpectedly um, <clears throat> if they just hadn't budgeted for that or hadn't planned for it. So the at-risk grant can be applied for at any time during the year. There are some uh, maximum amounts on that at-risk fund so it's not as large of a grant fund as the annual grants receive. Um, but we do recognize that things happen outside of a regular grant fund, so that's a possibility. Um, we have funded hay banks for many years. Um, we try to put hay banks across the state in different places where they might be needed. Um, we're currently running three hay banks, two hay banks this year. We've had as many as three or four hay banks. Um, COVID and the pandemic caused us to need a little bit more hay, but 
Um, and we generally, we grant that money through our at-risk fund, um, but, um, and have those hay banks managed generally by rescues or shelters in the area where the need might be. So we, we coordinate with them, they buy the hay, we, we fund that purchase, and then they work to distribute the hay when people ask. So um, we do hay banks. Um, we do, as I said, fund law enforcement agencies if they request need money for large intakes or something like that, we can, we can work with them there. Um, we've produced and sponsored several events, um, including the Colorado Comeback Challenge, where we um, partnered with Home for a Divorce, um, which was awesome. <laughs> we loved it, we had great, great response with that. That ran for three years in conjunction with the Rocky Mountain Divorce Expo. We also um, put on a show that we called the Battle on the Rockies, um, which was pretty much sponsored by us. And um, that was also in conjunction with the Horse Expo. And you, we put on a show for basically people who had adopted horses from rescues. So um, they could bring their horse that they had adopted and show the horse for prize money, including saddles and all kinds of fun stuff. So <laughs> that was a good time as well. Um, and then we also um, have started more frequently producing networking luncheons for rescue owners. Um, so rescues and shelters can send people to a networking luncheon where we have an educational program. Um, we also offer, when we say networking, nice to talk to people at lunch, but we also try to do a project after lunch where they kind of have to work together talk to each other. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, we found that that was initially in the, in the first, back in 2008, 2009 when we started, that that was a real struggle to get rescues to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it actually, the luncheons kind of fell away because of that, but we have tried to restart those and, and sponsor those. So we've had two of those so far. We're hoping to do two a year um, going forward. So I um, find that's it. I find it's a lot better now, I think, with everyone, the rescues being more open to working with each other and helping each other. I think it's, it's come a long way, it has, for sure. It comes the, That's very promising. Moving in the room used to be a little stressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not, not so much that way. It's better working together, for sure. Um, I, I think our, our luncheons and our networking have worked better when we put it on ourselves yes. rather than interact with uh, the Colorado Hex Horse Expo. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. It also gives us uh, a chance to um, get to know the horse rescue people. Um, unfortunately, there are Horse rescue people that do a lot better job than other horse rescue people, and it it kind of helps us uh, sift through the the different people um, so that we can uh, be more functional with our with our. Well, it, it makes sense to direct the resources where they're best being utilized. Yeah, yeah. I, it, you know, and it, there are people that go out and hang up a sign and say they're a horse rescue and and then want money. Right. And and quite honestly, um, our purpose, um, I put it pretty mundane. Uh, I, I want to get the horses out of the unwanted bucket and put them in the wanted bucket. Yes. And, uh, um, so that's kind of what we give our, our grants, uh, rather than just sanctuaries and that sort. Yes, sir. Time. Hey! <laughs> Take the floor. So again, my name is Sarah Coleman. I'm with the Kentucky Horse Council. I have been very fortunate to inherit a really strong council. Um, the two executive directors before me did absolutely amazing work, so I have been able to really capitalize on the momentum that they created. So what we call our SOHO fund, which is our Save Our Horses fund, is basically four-pronged. Um, we offer castration assistance, euthanasia assistance, 
feed and hay assistance and transportation assistance. So pretty much how that works is if you go on our website, it's, it, I, websites are hard sometimes for people to navigate. I'm always like, look for the magnifying glass, search your term. Um, but basically we never reimburse the owner. We always reimburse either the veterinarian or we buy the feed and hay directly from a feeder hay dealer and then the horse owner in need comes and picks it up. So with euthanasia assistance, we provide $150 per horse, up to $300 total um, for euthanasia unless there is an outstanding case. Um, I've networked pretty heavily with the vets who utilize that, that service in particular. Um, the castration assistance, we, don't, we do not get a lot of overt requests for that within Kentucky, randomly. We get a lot of calls from West Virginia. And well, it's like, really hey, good for us to know. know. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, we don't really have West Virginia horses, I'm sorry. Um, our feed and hay assistance is a little bit more detailed. They basically call, they say, hey, my name is so-and-so, I have a horse, I'm worried I'm not gonna be able to financially provide for them for their feed and hay. So we have a nutritionist, an equine nutritionist who sits on our board, um, and she is the one who, when I say, hey, this person says they feed, this really expensive food to these retired horses in straight alfalfa, she's who I lean on to go back and say, hey, you don't actually need this $30 a bag food. You know, you can get away with this 10% and this orchard grass mix. So that way they're not really mad at me when I say, <laughs> and also we can get them a lot further down the road with feed and hay, right. we can provide this more middle of the road um, sustenance. <laughs> So they call us, we provide feed and hay assistance. Um, generally it's about $300 is what we typically provide for someone in need. Um, it is for 30 days for two horses, renewable for those two horses again up to 60 days. So we are in Kentucky, luckily our grass is normally very good unless we get into trouble. So when I have people contact me in spring, I'll usually contact our nutritionist and they'll have a conversation and say, hey, can we get by with 30 days now? Hopefully the grass will come in and will buy you two or three months. If you're still in need in the fall, you can come back, you know. Um, we do have a lot of really hard conversations with horse owners. You know, if it's like they've got 16 horses and they can't feed them, you know, then we start having a conversation of, can we network you with the rest of you? Can we, you know, figure out how to assist you in you know, um, fitting your herd, essentially. And what ties into that is our transportation assistance. So we provide $1.25 a mile um, with additional 50 cents per, per mile for up to six horses for a horse to go from its location to a 501c3 rescue in Kentucky. Uh, we, a lot of people don't utilize that, honestly. We work pretty closely with one rescue in particular in Eastern Kentucky that gets the majority of those funds from us. Uh, we run into the same problem as nobody knows what we are, yes. nobody knows what we do, you know, we're like, ah, feed, educate, protect, and they're like, what does that mean? And you're like, everything, it's all the things, <laughs> all the things. We know it. Um, so the, the Horse Council in Kentucky is most recognizable by our license plate. That's how we get the majority of our funding. It's a foal lying in the grass. Um, we get about $115,000 to $117,000 a year from those license plate funds, and that is the vast majority of our, um, of our budget. So I'm the only full-time member. I have three part-time people who help me with various things. We're also membership-based, so they process memberships, help me with social media, things like that. But we do provide two other training programs that sort of fall under our, under our SOHO umbrella, and that's our livestock investigative training and our large animal emergency rescue training. And we basically are, again, seeking to educate um, you know, people within the community and our government officials on how they deal with horses that are in a potentially perilous situation. Not only physical wise, if they're in a sinkhole trailer turnover, but also if they are facing a potential abuse and neglect. That is time. I, I think I was just thinking about the, where you sort of screen a little bit more than I think a lot of us would think to do with adding that nutritional mm -hmm. component to it. I think that's, that's fantastic because a lot of times we just kind of tend to throw feet at those. Yes. Hope for the best, but yeah. that's, that's great, yeah. Um, Kristen, you're next. Awesome. Um, I'm Kristen Warner, my title is Senior Counsel from the Jockey Club, um, but I do a lot of our aftercare programs as well. So I'm just gonna touch on a few of them as well as some um, general thoroughbred industry initiatives that are related. So the first thing that the Jockey Club has um, is a program called Thoroughbred Connect. The easiest, fastest way I can describe it is online dating for thoroughbreds. Mm -hmm. So if you have a horse that needs a home, you add it into Thoroughbred Connect. If you are looking for a specific horse, say you won a lot of money on a horse at the racetrack and you would like to make sure it lands in a safe place, you can attach your name to the horse in Thoroughbred Connect. 
and then when the owner of the horse is looking for a place for the horse to go, they can log in and see that you're interested and contact you to see if you're still interested in the horse. Um, the Jockey Club switched over to digital certificates in 2018, and so now we have the benefit of Thoroughbred Connect records being attached to the horse's digital certificate. So when a person has a horse and they're trying to make uh, preparations to retire the horse, they can just log into their interactive registration account, pull up the horse's digital certificate, and scroll down the list and see who is interested in providing a home for the horse. So the digital world has really helped us to get that information more front and center with horse owners. Um, the other program that we have internally is um, a little bit related to this, but I have to talk about it because it's um, a big part of what we do um, in my department is the Thoroughbred Incentive Program. It was created to recognize and reward people who have chosen to get a thoroughbred off the track. Uh, we offer awards at horse shows around the country. We started with 150 shows in 2012, and we have 1,400 shows this year. So lots of thoroughbred awards being given all across the U.S. and Canada and Puerto Rico. Since then, we've also added two tip championship horse shows, a recreational riding program. We have two annual awards, one for a young rider and one for a horse that's doing a non-competitive career. We would consider that like therapy riding horse um, or a police horse. Um, and then we have a year-end program called the Performance Awards, which allows anyone who has a thoroughbred, no matter where they live, to get awards through our program. Um, hugely successful. We are approaching 40,000 horses with tip numbers, um, which is going to be pretty cool to see once that 40,000 40, number um, appears in our database. We also support the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, which Ashley has mentioned as part of the UHC database. The TAA was created in 2013 to inspect, accredit, and award grants to organizations that provide aftercare for thoroughbreds. Um, and so the Jockey Club has supported them since the beginning, and we continue to support them through a $25 donation that comes through every, pretty much every major registry service that we offer, registrations, names, duplicate certificates, anything that comes through the, the registry, $25 of the fee goes to aftercare. And then um, in the world of thoroughbreds, I also just want to make sure to mention the Thoroughbred Charities of America. Um, they also offer grants to aftercare organizations, and in the world of emergencies and disasters, they have a fund called the Horses First Fund that is available to help those specific type of situations. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. All right, I don't, you guys can decide which one of you would like to answer. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Alex Cox with the Equine Networks, a home for every horse. I am newer to my position, but our mission at A Home for Every Horse is to provide support and resources to 501c3 equine rescues, sanctuaries, and care facilities throughout the nation. And we do this with our program's many wonderful sponsors, as well as our resources within the equine network. Our goal is to bridge the gap between equine rescues and the resources that they need. We were founded in 2011, so we're going on just 13 years. And at the time, we were founded through equine.com, which at that point in time was the world's largest horse selling uh, website in the world. Our team noticed that rescuers were paying to post their horses online, and they were looking for new homes. So we realized there was a need within the industry and a call to help. So now um, rescues are able to post their rescue horses for free on equine.com and it started back then. We were able to form corporate partnerships with Anheuser-Busch, Carina, Tractor Supply, Weatherita, and Absorbing. Um, here through these corporate partnerships, we supply rescues in the spring and the fall. They can petition and apply to be a part of our program. All they need to do is verify that they are a 501c3, and through this, each spring and fall, we send out different care packages that have coupons for feed, um, they can apply for grants for hay, as well as winter blankets and other resources. Um, we promote our, prop, our program by sharing user-generated content on our website, as well as our social media, so we get to share all of the warm, fuzzy, amazing um, start-to-finish rescue uh, stories and people who have found their forever horses through A Home for Every Horse. And then a couple of our stats. We've helped rehome over 12,000 horses throughout the year. We helped more than 600 rescues nationwide. We fed over 1,500 tons of feed um, that's been donated and over 900,000 meals. That's a lot. Um, Alex is new to this role, but coming in um, with so much energy and delight. So I'm here to, here to support her. I'm the director of um, client operations services for the Equine Network, so I come with a little bit more of like the corporate lens and how we work with our, our advertisers and these great industry partners. 
Um, so we're we're very pleased with like what a home for every horse has done, but also for where we can kind of partner with you all, right, and continue to bring resources and continue to share these stories um, across all of the Equine Networks brands, right? So partnering with Equus to tell those warm, fuzzy stories and, and highlighting on horse and rider, right? Like maybe maybe there's a barrel horse that comes to a rescue um, that we see on equine.com. How can we, you know, tell that to the horse and rider audience or the barrel racing magazine audience, right? And just leveraging the different channels that we have to spread the word and hopefully connect more horses and give them those homes. Let's make them wanted again. That's the goal. Excellent. Okay. <coughs> well, let's move into question two. What am I doing on time? Perfect. You're right okay. on time. Okay. Question number two. This is going to be directed at Dr. Kate Lewis and Dr. Carl Heckendorf. Am I saying that correctly? Okay. Um, of the Colorado Unwanted Horse Alliance. You have five minutes. Um, now, when I was doing search a search for panelists this year uh, for our meeting, I thought that Colorado, Colorado Unwanted Horse Alliance was um, especially interesting that it's not just one organization, um, but you're basically an alliance of many organizations in Colorado um, who have come together on a state level to help at-risk horses and their owners, which I, I think is just fascinating that you're able to get that many people together. Um, can you tell us how you came about and what it takes to bring everybody to the table and work collaboratively with, on this endeavor? You want to do it or you want me? <laughs> well, I'll start and you can do it. Okay. How's that? Um, sure. Um, the Colorado Unwanted Horse Alliance <coughs> started about 2008, 2007. Um, and I can tell you what brings a lot of people to the table is a crisis. <laughs> and if you remember back then, um, there were several things going on. The economy wasn't good. Um, the domestic horse processing plants were closing. Um, and we had a lot of horses that were not looking so good and not having a place to go here in Colorado and, and in many states. And so um, at the time I worked, I was working with the Colorado Department of Agriculture, Dr. Heckinger was there and is still currently with the Department of Agriculture. Um, and other people that we were talking to, um, law enforcement agencies, animal control, um, who else? Colorado Veterinary Medical Association. Um, in Colorado we have an animal, it's called the Animal Assistance Foundation and it's a private foundation that was set up by the Coors family. Um, to help support animal rescue and animal animals in need, animals of all types, not just pet animals. But um, so, Animal Assistance Foundation was was also involved. Um, the Denver Dumb Friends League, which is a huge nonprofit here in, in Colorado, um, that's how we got everyone at the table. <coughs> there was there was an issue. CSU, Colorado also. State University. Um, we also had them at the table. We had someone representing the Animal Welfare Council um, slash PRCA, which is a pro rodeo, or pro rodeo um, organization. And we, we just started a conversation, really, is what we did. And where was the need? What was the problem? Um, what could be done to help mitigate some of the issues? And, and with the economy being the way it was, I think the, the first thing we all came to was, how can we help with funding or grant money? Do we, is it a matter of going and finding other grant money or is it developing something in our own state? And so that's where the conversation began. Um, we looked into some metrics. We did some surveys, um, got some information about where the need might be. And um, and said, let's let's form this unwanted horse alliance amongst all of these folks, and um, start seeing where we can help. Um, we already had a little bit of a model with the Colorado Pet Overpopulation Fund, which was started before the unwanted horse alliance, and the Pet Overpopulation Fund was the same thing: a, a collaboration of agencies that got together, had a funding source, and 
that funding went back out to veterinarians, um, shelters and rescues to help spay and neuter pets. And so um, <clears throat> we, we took that model and went to the state legislator, Lecher, and we're able to get on to what Colorado has, and I'm not sure there are some other states that have um, what's called a checkoff fund, and uh, taxpayers can donate all or some of their tax refund to nonprofit agencies. Um, the fund used to be limited to 15, 15 different agencies, and now those agencies are still listed on the checkoff, but a taxpayer can select a different fund um, as long as it's a 501c3, they can select a different fund and write it in and, and donate that way. But that's where Kuha gets um, probably 99% of our funding is from the state tax checkoff. I didn't even think about a checkoff. Yeah, that's, that's and, um, a great example for the other states if you're interested. Yeah, there, I know there are a few other states that have them. I, I don't have them off the top of my head. Um, but uh, we probably average about 90 Ninety thousand a year over the last since we've got on the checkoff in 2010. So we've been there, and, and um, in the past few years, the we've done well over a hundred thousand a year, and that's where we get the majority of our funding. Some private donations um, as well, but that's a little bit of how we started, and we currently are comprised of I don't know how many organizations we have on our on our board now. <laughs> that is time if you want to okay. add any other thoughts. Can I ask a question? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> do you guys advertise to people to do the checkoff, or are they just checking it off as part we of it? We do a little bit of advertising. Um, we started when we first got on there. We did quite a bit um, trying to get posters and information out to equine related places, but we haven't really. <laughs> our board is pretty small and, and all volunteers, so um, we don't have a lot of advertising, and they still. They still Sorry. come to us, so Sorry. as long as our name is on there, I think that's huge. If if we didn't have the tax checkoff, we I was the, yeah, probably I that would is, not be in existence. And uh, uh, you know, I guess over the years, it 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 really has evolved, and I'm not. 100% crazy about this idea, but it has involved to where we fund horse rescues. Uh, I like when we work with you folks and had the comeback challenge and so on. We were able to, I don't know, Kate, what was it? We, we placed about 60 or 70 about horses. 65 over, horses after over two or three years. years. And, uh, you know, the people really enjoy uh, those horses. Uh, you may not know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it. How do you, and maybe it's just for my own sake, how do you propose, like, get, how do you get on to a checkoff? Um, in Colorado, you have to go through the legislature, so you have to have a legislative sponsor, and then they have to, okay. have to take you through as a bill to get you on the, on the checkoff. Okay, next. Sarah, this one is for you. Okay. Okay, so one of the things that I especially love about Kentucky Horse Council is that you offer the, the gelding program or voucher program, um, the safety net, pro, you know, safety net feed vouchers and the euthanasia vouchers to horse owners. Um, with the SOHO fund, what would you estimate is the yearly cost to run the program? Um, where does your funding come from? And how extensive is it in terms of staff hours? So you kind of alluded to that a little bit to run the program. So I'm saying this in, in the guise of if another house horse council and we're wanted to take on something like this. Um, and then my second part to this is how successful are you in finding, or how, how successful are you finding the programs to be? And if there's any story you would like to share in particular, feel free. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so our SOHO programs have been around for, for quite a while. They were in place when I came into the Horse Council. 
and it kind of differs year by year mm -hmm. about how much funding we put into each of those buckets, for lack of a better word. We also were concerned with COVID. Um, I, I should back up and say I have a really fantastic board. We have 18 members on our board. They're everything from our equine nutritionists and veterinarians to people who are involved in equine publishing, you know, just amateur horse owners, people who are passionate about horses. So they all come to what the Horse Council's mission is with a very broad lens, which is really helpful because we don't end up just supporting one breed or rescue. So typically what we do is when we get any of our requests in, feed, gelding, transportation, euthanasia, I send that to my health and welfare committee. That committee chair and all of those committee members have to agree to fund that. They, they've never said no, unless it is someone who, like when we call for reference, like we call their you know, boarding bar owner and say, hey, this person is telling us they don't have funding and they're like, yeah, no, they're driving a Mercedes. That's, that's something where we wouldn't necessarily fund them. Uh, thankfully, that's obviously very minimal. Um, the other thing that I should add in here is that, you know, Kentucky, since I came in, Kentucky has faced two massive natural disasters. Um, we have the tornadoes in Western Kentucky and the floods in Eastern Kentucky. And I know that you guys all love your horse communities. I'm telling you, there is no horse community like that in Kentucky because the first thing they did was call and say, how can we help? You know, we had our transportation companies were like, we'll bring anything you want anywhere you need. You know, there's farmers calling saying, hey, we have hay, we have this, we have that. So I have to kind of say, we don't always necessarily have to buy things for the horse owners, you know. Um, but we also receive a lot of grants that we help do those programs with. So I would say on average, we spend, I bet since I started in the end of 2020, we've spent maybe $300 on castration. We've spent probably about 500 or so on euthanasia. And we have done our feed assistance is by far the most, and it still is not that much. It's probably right about $2,000. Now, is that because people don't know about our programs? We don't, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like that is, that is more, I think, the issue. I know the need, like we all know the need is out there, right? Um, it's just making sure they know about us and, and that we're here. The staff hours, again, because I rely so heavily on my committees, um, I'll send them an email and I'll say, what are your questions? You know, do you want me to get clarification on anything other than what's on this standardized PDF application? Sometimes there are follow-up questions, sometimes there's not. Uh, but a lot of times it's, and it's what you guys all do too, right, is it's opening lines of communication. We really just want to make sure they know that the Kentucky Horse Council is there and will assist them in any way we possibly can, even if that's just networking them with someone else in their area. So I, I will say we are membership based, but like I had mentioned to you guys, the majority of our funding comes from the license plates. So, but if we were to call out a specific need, like when we had the flood and the tornadoes, and we said, please donate, it will specifically go in this emergency bucket. Um, and we also are very heavily networked with our extension agents in all 120 counties that are employed by the University of Kentucky. They are our boots on the ground. So when I call them and I say, hey, what does your county need? They literally know all of the horse owners in their county and can say, um, we need X rolls of, you know, bailing twine, or not bailing twine, but like fencing, and we need fencing T posts, and we need X amount of hay. Um, they're really, they are who we rely on to help us do our job well and make sure that the resources that we procure are not, they don't go to waste. Um, in addition to that, we work really closely with the Kentucky Department of Ag and there's another organization called the Kentucky Livestock Coalition that is all the executive directors of all the commodity groups in Kentucky. So it's everything from like soybean and corn to poultry, beef, dairy. They are also my lifeline to different areas of the state in which I'm not involved. So it's kind of like what we all do is it's networking to figure out how we can do our job the best and then figure out how we can support horse owners in those areas. So I don't have hard and fast. That's great. I'm no. sorry. <laughs> I, did, I just was thinking about the extension specialists and how yeah. they're, I, I feel like, yeah, they're definitely they're underutilized they're resource for sure. Yes. And I've got my wheels turning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, next we have, oh, Kristen, you're up. Okay. Um, so we talk a lot in the industry about full circle programs and, um, you know, first right of refusal con contracts, adoption contracts, which are all centered around making sure that the horse changes owners um, or hands that they always have sort of soft place to come back to. Um, so my question to you is, while aftercare organizations can include safeguards like first right of refusal or return policies in their adoption contracts, um, what can private owners or for-profit retrainers do to provide safeguards 
to the horses that they rehome. Sure. So I think um, just to kick off, you know, when you sell a horse, you can still also do a contract for first sale of the horse. So you can still include things like a uh, right of first refusal on a resale. Um, something else that would be a good idea um, to protect a horse is to not allow for the horse to be resold for zero dollars. You know, zero dollar sale or something like that probably indicates that it's not going to the greatest place um, or that it has issues that might be a potential uh, at risk situation. Um, you can also encourage for-profit aftercare organizations or private owners to work with an aftercare organization. If, if it's a large scale private retrainer of thoroughbreds, for example, you know they may get some horses in that looked great when they came off the trailer and a month in they realized that maybe the horse isn't going to be sound long term. And so if they have a working relationship with an aftercare organization, particularly one that's maybe a sanctuary or can do long term rehab, um, that they could then place that horse with that aftercare organization um, and make sure that it has a safe place to land rather than just trying to resell it to someone else or again, do a zero dollar sale to somebody and not know where the horse goes. So I think you know as a private owner, private reseller, you can still kind of keep in mind how to protect the horse long term, just in the, the, the better interest of the horse and for the industry, uh, just make sure that they're not kind of going to the the 4 h -er or the nice farm that we all hear about where these horses go and you no know, one actually knows where those 4 h uh, all exist. Um, from the jockey club side of things, two options. One, I touched on Thoroughbred Connects. Certainly anyone who is reselling horses, if you are interested in getting that horse back at any point in its life, you can add the horse to your Thoroughbred Connect account. We do have some breeders and race trainers and owners that put all their horses into the program. We also have some aftercare organizations that put all their horses into the program so that in the case of down the road when the horse has the need for aftercare or um, ends up in a bad spot or is found in a kill pen, they can go log in and find out who is interested in maybe taking care of that horse. Um, and then the last thing uh, the Jockey Club has is a process called retired from racing, transfer just retired from racing. So with thoroughbreds, obviously their main career is going to be at the racetrack. And a lot of times what we have are folks who do not want that horse to be raced anymore, um, usually because of soundness issues or other uh, long-term health issues that the horse is facing. So the Jockey Club has a program called transfer just retired from racing where both the seller and the owner, have, or the, seller, the owner and the buyer have to agree that the horse is gonna be permanently retired from racing. And they fill out a form, send in photographs of the horse so we can verify that the horse they're retiring is in fact in their possession and also the horse that we registered. Um, and then both parties sign it and then the horse is, is retired from racing and is no longer eligible to be entered in any recognized thoroughbred racing, and that includes steeplechase. That's the only way to permanently ensure that a horse is not going to show back up in the entry box of the track. We do have people that try to write not to be raced on papers, although that, that won't be an option going forward now that we have digital certificates. Um, and that all that, that does not permanently keep the horse from racing. So we are we're trying to push people towards using the, the proper processes. And we have just now um, turned that process into a digital process. It used to be you had to get forms signed and notarized, which a, a lot of the rescues in particular complained that was too much paperwork on their part. So we now have an online process where the forms are digitally signed using DocuSign. So we get that same um, assurances that it is the people signing it, um, that it is a faster and easier process for particularly aftercare organizations to use. Excellent. I was thinking, um, I don't know if these exist out there in this audience, but it would be great if I can put maybe some example contracts on the UHC site for the average horse owner to access, because I know Maybe sometimes doing a Google search isn't super helpful, but um, that might be a great resource for us to add to the site as well. And, and having a bill of sale generally is yes. really the first thing. To yes. <laughs> so if anybody happens to have examples of these contracts, I don't have to go looking for them. Can you send them my, <laughs> send them my way? I just don't know what legalities go with it, so I'll have to look into it. Um, okay, next question for Katie and Alex. Um, so a home for every horse is near and dear to my heart. You guys are partners with us. Um, and I absolutely love seeing the uh, thank you cards and the emails that we get forwarded to us from the rescues that have received the coupons and the blankets. And it makes me happy, makes my day. Um, and rescues are absolutely integral to, obviously, our, our work here at UHC and our ability to help out our horses. Um, and you support 
our rescues through many different avenues, including some wonderful perks from the Home for Every Horse sponsors. Um, how do you go about finding and connecting with so many great industry businesses and getting them on board with supporting these rescues? And then on a smaller scale, to her, uh, any advice that you can offer industry businesses, so you know, people in this room or, or the broader audience, um, to think about how they can support at-risk courses or rescues? Beautiful. I think I can take the first one. Um, so talking about um, finding businesses and connecting them with the Home for Every Horse, um, Equine Network works with 300, 500 plus companies, right, in terms of advertising. Um, so we had all of these great people coming to us, and I still do, and we love that part of our business, right? But there's a bigger conversation there about how can we leverage that conversation and amplify that messaging in a more positive way, right? Like, what, what does the industry need, and how can we put those resources to a better use? Um, so a home for every horse is born, right, um, uh, from, from those wonderful um, sponsorships and those great people. So finding them was really more of a conversation, right? It's mutual need of, you know, we see this identified in the industry and how can we come together with the great power that is our platform and our audience and the audience of those companies and use that messaging to come together and multiply that to provide resources. Um, every year, the Equine Network does a state of the industry study um, across our audiences and collects that data and kind of uses that to help us craft our decisions and, and, and position ourselves in the market and just sort of get a feel for what's going on in the industry that we can tell from the people who engage with our brands. Um, and the 2022 industry survey, um, two, two things really stand out from that that speaks to this as well. So 35% of horse owners consider it very or extremely important to purchase from equine brands that support causes that they care about. So people are already, they vote with their dollars, right? We know this. Um, so organizations that can be tied to those causes that matter to horse owners matter to us. So having that conversation and giving them the opportunity to have that space is really <clears throat> all that it took, right? Uh, you know, that's, that's really as simple as that. And how can we uh, put you with this cause that your buyers and your horse owners um, care about? Um, another interesting statistic um, that came out of that survey that might be of importance to everyone in this room and should be, um, from 2022, from the previous year, concern over the ability to pay for and keep horses has risen to 6.3, a rating of 6.3 on 10, um, from 3.6. So it's more than doubled in a year. So this is um, something we know that we need to continue to address, um, and that we have those conversations with our partners to continue to bring them into that. Concern is rising, right? We know this from our consumers, from our readers, from our audience at the Equine Network. Um, so how can we continue to address that and continue to provide resources to those rescues as this concern is gonna be part of our role for the foreseeable future, right? What can we do for that? So anyhow, um, hopefully that helps answer that question a little bit about um, how we found them and how we continue to work with these great partners and bring them into this conversation. And then I think you can take the second part on the smaller scale side. Absolutely. The advice that we can offer would be pick a day and make it happen. Whether that's through time, talent, or treasure, we've definitely done that at the Equine Network where we've picked a day in 2022. And for those of our members who lived in Colorado, we went to a local rescue and we volunteered and helped them. So it's simply, it's as simple as approaching a rescue and asking how, do, how can we help you? And whether that's boots on the ground or by time or with money, um, that really makes a big difference. With over the 600 rescues we do have nationwide, something we're also doing this year in a local rescue in Missouri is that we're partnering with Anheuser-Busch and Purina, and they're picking a day to come out with their staff and do a volunteer day at a rescue. So we're going to take that, use it as a great public relations message for them, also for us, but also giving back to a local rescue, which is so, so important. Um, something that we'd also like to try to instigate in 2024 um, would be an industry-wide volunteer at a horse rescue day. So that's something that we would like to implement because it's so important. This is our why of why everyone is in this industry. And it's so important to be able to go back to the roots of this is our why and we love horses and we truly want the best for every, each and every horse. And so really just picking a day and making it happen. And then also, Having industry unity and having those key partnerships, whether it's among corporate partners or whether it's amongst ourselves and how we can help position each other or help promote each other throughout everything. That's a great, I like that idea of a volunteer, doing a volunteer day for a rescue. Sends a, sends a great message to your, your members. Okay, so I am going to give Sarah, because she's wearing two hats, 
Um, five minutes if she'd like to talk about Vet Direct. Absolutely. So how many of you guys here have heard of the Vet Direct Safety Net Program? Good. <laughs> so the Vet Direct Safety Net Program falls under the the, they're under a charitable arm of the American Association of Equine Practitioners, which is the foundation for the horse. The program is basically, in a nutshell, it's a $600 stipend that can be applied to a horse owner in need of financial assistance. So it was originally started by the ASPCA. It was a pilot program of theirs. They were trying to figure out how could they keep more owned horses in homes, you know, keep them out of our rescue space and our adoption space. And what they found out through a series of surveys was that the majority of people who were surrendering their horses didn't actually want to surrender their horses. But they were in some form of financial crisis, um, you know, divorce, medical need, child got sick, et cetera. And horse stoppers right when their horse also did something very dramatic, um, you know, colic, choke, et cetera. So the ASPCA ran the program for a while. They discovered that it was going to work, and they basically graciously handed it off to the foundation for the horse. And the, the way the entire program works is any vet clinic or veterinarian that is, in a, is a member of the American Association of Equine Practitioners can become enrolled in the program. It's very, very simple. It's a 15 to 20 minute onboarding process. They sign a couple pieces of paper that say we understand this is how the program works and they're enrolled. So the entire purpose of the program is to help horses that are having an immediate welfare need. So they're a medical colic, they have eye issues, they become neurologic, they're Cushing's, they run through a fence, they need stitches, staples, something that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, this provides that up to $600 per horse for that family to get assistance to care for that immediate need problem. It is not applicable to things like um, colic surgery, PRP, you know, the, the things that we consider, not, they're not necessarily superfluous, but they're beyond the scope of what that $600 could really make an impact on their bill. And the program has been awesome. Like it is, it is super easy to enroll. We've had a lot, our interest is building and building and building as more people get enrolled. Um, we started out, I started out cold calling and cold emailing and you wanna talk about a hard sell? They're like, hey, we wanna give you $600. And they're like, like clear the spin. Um, but it has been really fun. You know, it has, it has, we've been able to see just these really great impacts that that $600 can make. And I will be honest, I was like 600 bucks. I mean, really in the grand scheme of things, is that a lot? But when we were able to take how much, you know, the, the median of what we pay out, it still makes a really big difference. And I will tell you from what I have seen that $600 per horse is really important because it's not per owner. So if there is a barn fire, a herd of horses gets out and hit on a road, you know, it's six, if it's a mare and foal, we've had a couple of those cases lately and they have to go to a clinic, it's $600 per equine, which is very helpful. Um, the other really nice part is that if it's a multi-doctor practice, only one of those vets needs to be an AAEP member to have the entire practice be on board. So typically when I talk with the bigger practices, I'll call their HR person or their admin head person. I'll onboard them. We'll offer an opportunity for any of their vets to come in and ask questions. Um, but it's, it's really very simple. Usually what I have to do now though is with those multi-vet practices is I have to follow up every couple months and be like, hey, just remember, we haven't had any requests lately. We're still here. We're still trying to give you money. Um, we, I will tell you personally an experience I just had with this program. It was not my horse, thank God. Um, but another horse at our farm was attacked by dogs about two weeks ago. It's an 18-year-old quarter horse. He's lovely, but he has had some really, really mad, big, big bills. Uh, and I was able to contact, you know, Haggard Equine Medical Institute, which is a local, local clinic in Lexington, and I said, hey, I really just want to remind you guys that this program is here. And it's just really nice to be able to reach out to people and say, we know you guys are totally panicking about your horse right now, and we want to give you a little bit of financial peace of mind. Um, we do still struggle, so I would love it if every one of you either emailed me or went home and said, hey, have you guys heard of this? You know, usually what I do now is once I onboard our vets, I say, the only thing I ask of you is that you send me an email with the names and contact info of at least two sets. And then usually when I can say, hey, so-and-so told me to call you, they won't hang up on me, which is kind of nice. Um, but it is a really great program. It's done a lot of really good work. Uh, we do occasionally have to have the conversations of, hey, yeah, we're gonna run these, you know, tests for metabolic issues and things like that. But if the answer comes back and it's you need ongoing medication, you know, you need corrective shoeing, that's a bigger conversation, right? 
So sometimes we have to have that conversation and say, we can get you over this hump of what is your plan yeah. long term. Because this is, in, its intention is to be a one-time stipend. Uh, you know, obviously, I hope nothing crazy ever happens, like it colics and then two months later runs for a fence. But if it does, you know, it, the, the other beauty of the program is nobody needs to call me or AAP or for them, for the Foundation for the Horse to get the okay. They, we always tell those vets, you guys know your clients, right? Like, you know their financial situation, you don't need our approval. And then they just go in, the vets literally, it's, I, take, I think it takes five to seven minutes, they fill out a quick Google Forms, and it just asks very briefly, what was the situation, what is the client's financial situation, and they can literally just say, you know, on a fixed income, daughter is ill, blah, 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 just got divorced. And then they usually upload their prognosis for the horse, and then also their invoice. And we very rarely decline a case unless it's totally outside, like, hey, we set it to college surgery and it was $25,000. And we're like, that's the, you know, we were, we're very explicit when we onboard people into what is covered and not covered. Um, but it is, a, it, it honestly is a wonderful program. And it is, you see some really interesting stuff. Like we had a standard red that rolled on a brown recluse and it, and like de gloved its leg, and the woman was like, I have no idea if this is going to be covered. And I was like, Well, that's a perfect tool. Wow. So, you see some really interesting cases, and some of them you're kind of like, Oh, I hope that never happens again. Yeah, um, but again, it, it is a program, it just has to be an AEP member. But I would love to talk to any of your veterinarians or people you know of who you think might be able to uh, benefit from the program. So, reoccurring theme is we have these really great programs, but nobody knows about them. So, everyone's homework in this room is. <laughs> Shout it out there, you would <laughs> see exists and that direction. Yes, exactly. Can I have a comment on yeah. that? Absolutely. So UHC and PWC are mostly funded by grants and AEP, ASPCA have both been really great funders for both these programs. When you're applying for outside grants, marketing is a really unsexy stuff. <laughs> Nobody That's wants to fund critical. marketing from scientific groups, research groups, nonprofit groups. They only want to fund the hands-on stuff. So if there's anything you can do to support these orgs, our orgs, with marketing just to get the word out there, that is a huge benefit yes. to Absolutely. all the organizations. Doesn't cost anything to put a link on your site, something simple like that, put it in your newsletter. Tag them on your Facebook and yeah, Instagram. Yeah, Facebook, links. share it on social media. All things in the, join the effort booklet. <laughs> okay, uh, Emily Actually, tells me I'm running Actually, can I just ask you? Yeah. I, I want to make a comment, but also ask a question. Yep. Sorry, sorry. I said I was going to do this thing. I really <laughs> did. Sorry about that. When we ran the program at ASPC, the, the, the one thing I always get on the back end is how many horses were ultimately surrendered that you guys um, helped with that, right? When we ran the program, it was less than a half of a percent of horses that we had ever held during the duration. This was 200 horses when we ran the program that were ultimately surrendered, which sort of proves a need in our mind for a community-based veterinary, practical veterinary program, because that's what the program is, is going to reference, this practical um, vet care. I don't know what it is now, most of the question I was going to ask, if you guys still track that, if you go back 30, 60 days, whatever, mm -hmm. find out, are they still staying in the home? And that, I'll be very honest, I am just a contractor with them, so I don't see all of the behind the scenes stuff. That would be a question for Sue, because she basically oversees all of it. And I will say one thing that I, is very important that I forgot to mention in the assistance that the Vetric program provides, it also provides that $600 can also be used for euthanasia. And that's really important, because I will tell you, I have learned how expensive it is to euthanize and remove and especially in the Northeast in California. It's such a regional thing. I have wow. a very large soapbox. We're both in the Northeast, and you could be spending $2,000 for euthanasia and aftercare in the Northeast. There is no public rendering. Mm -hmm. You cannot take carcasses to the dump. You cannot bury due to high water tables. So you're looking at cremation or composting and trailering that carcass um, hundreds of miles sometimes. It's wild. Well, now we have to pry open the discussion about podiatry care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, this is why I want a day meeting for you to see. There's just so much to talk about. Somebody made a comment earlier about doing some pre sort of package pieces that organizations could put in their newsletters. If there's a way to get the links and get pieces of that to those of us that are with other organizations, yep. I'm with the Horses oh, well, and Humans Research Foundation, that would be great, rather than us go, oh, we want to make sure we link with you and we link with you. If coming out of this meeting, we could get that, 
I think that would be a, a I way will to tell you, I don't know if this helps or not, but we do have everything is like all our materials, all of our PDF, PDFs and whatnot, all on the website, all free, all easy to access under educational materials on the UHC site. And, and we have our coalition of state horse councils and the American Horse Council is really good about sending out email blasts that say, hey, please consider sharing this with your membership, that kind of stuff. I know a lot of times it does end up in spam, so I'm sure that we send yeah. stuff in your like, that's oh, one thing. That's we have a Megan now too. We yes. haven't had a Megan for several years, so having someone can direct you to get stuff. It's been a huge asset. Yeah, we're trying to build, a, we're trying to build our own mailing list to send out different press releases and everything. We utilize the American Horse publications a lot as well, um, which is not just for publications, but also for businesses and um, organizations can join. Um, so yeah, so if anybody that wants to, that's like, hey, we need to get some of this information. If you want to stop by at some time this week and give me your business card, I'd be glad to take it. Emily, I'm oh, sorry. Real quick, I also know that. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I also know that prepackaged information sent directly to you is the easiest way to get it out. So that's a soapbox that I learned from AAP and that I'm going to make sure that I get on before I jump back into the school year. Ashley, you have one more Text. Go ahead. It, it's just an observation or a comment that. It's so interesting to hear about these services that are out there and they're not being utilized. So marketing is so important and what we've found is uh, when we ran the veteran program and also with other things we do, you have to lower the barriers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We cannot put these forms in front of people and say, prove to me yep. what kind of crisis you're in. They're in a crisis, right? So like removing those barriers, lowering those barriers, trusting that that's going to where it needs to be and having, like you said, the practitioners make that decision makes all the difference. We can't, yeah. we gotta make it easier to, for people yep. to get these yep. services. And mm -hmm. if you want data to back that up from the EWDC, we found of those 77% of owners surrendering horses, um, they're experiencing the majority of them a short-term financial issue. Horses spend up to a year in rescues and that is consuming a vast amount of financial and logistical services. So if you can support even just one owner from having to bring their horse to that rescue for a short term, other logistical husbandry assistance is a big one now. If an owner ends up in a hospital for six weeks, they shouldn't have to surrender their horse if they're gonna be fine coming out. So you could help a rescue divert thousands of dollars just by giving an owner $600. Right, yeah. yep. and that's the ultimate goal. Keep that horse at home, keep it out of the system. Um, so Emily tells me I'm really, really No, you're perfect, you're perfect now. I am? Okay. Well, no, I have to, uh, just a quick wrap up. I know we had a, a question. Um, if you guys just want to give a quick, any other thing you'd like to add, feel free. We got like four minutes before we have to jump into the panel. Is that right? Oh, can I add one thing about yeah. the owner assistance? So the, the Kentucky Horse Council, the same with, you know, basically all every up here, we work on education. So the livestock investigative training that we provide to sheriffs, animal control officers, et cetera, focuses really heavily on what information can you provide horse owners with so that their owners don't get confiscated. Um, so we offer a three-day training for that. It's way too much for most people. So we're doing our livestock investigative training in a box and we're taking it on the road this fall. And it's basically to go to these outlying counties and I'm sure you guys probably know but Kentucky's animal welfare laws are terrible. I think we're 48th in the nation for lack of animal protectiveness. Um, so we are working on basically handouts and we are more than happy to share that with anyone that's just it's literally basic feeding body conditions or why your horse needs its teeth and feet done. But again same as not surrendering them to rescues our goal is to not take them out of the home if it is truly just um, a lack of education and not uh, direct malice. Ashley and I both come from a background of hands-on rescue and, and Ashley with animal control for a while. Um, horses going, I like the numbers, so so going back to numbers, 10% of horses ending up in rescues are coming from law enforcement confiscations comparative to dog and cat, which are at one to 2%. The issue with law enforcement taking cons, uh, confiscations is for law enforcement to get involved, that horse has to be underweight, has to have medical issues, needs to be a biohazard to the water in the area for a uh, legally uh, uh, animal control officer to take a horse. Conditions have to be very bad. So for that horse to end up in a rescue, you're looking at even more resources. 
Um, and oftentimes you're locked into a case, and so yes. these rescues are stuck with a horse or a case of horses for four years. And that's a huge dollar amount for a rescue. So again, coming back to let's try to keep get ahead of the problem and address it at the source before it comes to a crisis scenario. I think the only thing I would add is, you know, we've heard a lot about a lot of great programs today. I'm sure there are some you all are doing that we don't know about. We'd love to hear about them. And also, if you want to get any information about any of the programs we're doing, specifically accreditation um, or, or accreditation-like program where you know organizations are reviewed to make sure they're legitimate organizations, we're more than happy to talk about that process. Um, the TAA in particular helped the Standard Bread Transition Alliance to be formed. and. You know, they're doing a great job now with standard breads, similar to what thoroughbreds are doing. Um, and legitimate rescues and organizations that are doing a good job are only benefiting the entire industry. So that's it's a, definitely a standard we like to continue to bring up across the board. Anything else any of our panelists would like to add? I think I'll just piggyback on that too. I mean, uh, a lot of what I hope for is that's similar, right? And just that being that resource of, you know, who is a legitimate 501c3 and how can we partner with them? Um, but there's a lot of businesses who have product that they want to get to those legitimate organizations. So I think that's a great point. We can kind of drive that point home, right? Like there's so many charitable organizations amongst the equine industry, businesses or otherwise, that want to be able to give, but want to be able to give in the right ways. So let's maybe help educate. I think that's a great place to start. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to give a great round of applause for our family.